Hey there, good morning everybody and a uh, big shout out to all of you. I'm Steve Farrell. I am a co-founder of Humanities Team and I'm coming to you live from our Humanities Team studio in the beautiful Boulder, Colorado and it is gorgeous here today. Wow, the spring in Boulder is uh, some kind of beautiful. And speaking of beautiful, well look at who my guest is here today. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Uh, Anna Dea Judith, um, PhD, and uh, I'll give her a proper introduction in a moment. Uh, Anna Dea, thanks so much for joining me. Steve, it's an honor to have a conversation with you, always. Uh, right, and, uh, and you, you were just sharing where you're coming from, talk, talking about coming in from a beautiful spot. What, uh, what are you overlooking there, Anna Dea? Well, I'm overlooking the wetlands as the Petaluma River goes into the north end of the San Francisco Bay. And uh, it's a little cloudy today, but the spring is just bursting out. And this is the goddess in all her glory. <laughs> yes, it is. Boy, and that's, that's Marin County, uh, everybody. This is Northern California, Marin County, just over the Golden Gate Bridge. Used to live out there. Uh, boy, the hiking, biking, just walking in nature. Doesn't get better than that. Just gorgeous. So, uh, so nice to have you with me. And a day. And uh, big shout out to everybody in the studio. I want to wave because I can see on camera some of you. You're on camera. There you go. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you all for being in the studio with us. These are Humanity Stream Plus uh, members, and they're uh, right here in the green room, so they can actually come on camera if they want. Uh, nice to have uh, that live audience with us. Uh, and a day of Judith's friends. So shout out to all of you. Whoa. Nice to be with you. Uh, humanities team friends. So we're out on Facebook right now. We're out on YouTube. Uh, we're also out through the Sign Network. That's John Raymer's Sign.network. And we're broadcasting to lots of uh, cool sites all over the world. So, uh, hey, you know, thank you all for joining us. Got a really powerful, fun, uh, exciting, important program in store for you here this next hour. So it's live. And as always, if you have something you want to get to Anadea, uh, try and get it in the chat uh, to us here earlier in the hour, and we'll uh, try and get to those here before we go off the air today. Okay, our theme is connection to the goddess. Uh, and if you know something about Anadea, Judith, you know this is, boy, this is the thing. We're going to really go deep on this whole connection to the goddess. There's a lot to, to tell you here, a lot, a lot to discuss. Okay, let me, um, let me give... Anadea, a proper introduction. So uh, this is a little longer than normal, but it's all important. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it. Here we go. This special session with Anadea Judith, PhD, will explore the resurgence of the goddess, challenge and broaden your perceptions of the divine feminine, and uncover the path to reclaim and rejuvenate your sacred connection to the goddess in your own life. Anadea's insights offer a profound invitation to all seekers and souls ready to journey deep into their spiritual perceptions, aiming for personal growth and collective enlightenment regarding the divine. She is a globally recognized teacher, speaker, healer, and writer on the intersection of personal and collective awakening, a lifelong student of somatic psychology, mythology, history, sociology, systems, theory, and mystic spirituality. Anadea is best known for her groundbreaking work reviving the chakra system of ancient yoga and its profound correlation to human psychology, cultural evolution, and the downward process of manifestation. With over a million books in print, her work has been translated into 28 languages. She is the founder and director of the teaching organization Sacred Centers, a member of the Evolutionary Leadership Council, and has been called a prophet of our time. And uh, welcome again, Anadea. Woo, that's a lot. And uh, all of these things are true. I've read her material. Whoa. Talking about profound and deep. So welcome again, Anadea. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. That's a great, great welcome. And I'm so happy to be here with Humanities Team and so respect all that you have done to create that and serve the world. That's what we're about. We're here to serve and give back and take this paradigm to a new level. Yes, it is. Boy, in some ways, it's kind of about being the living God, isn't it? Because we're all a part of the one. And uh, she... Uh, I'm going to use the she vernacular here. Uh, she, uh, she'll express through us if we want, won't she? I mean, it, if we say, okay, I'm in, I surrender in, boy, she's going to come in uh, in a big, big, powerful way, right? That is absolutely true because uh, she needs us as avatars, so to speak, to do the work. 
You know, our mouths, our hands, our feet, our hearts, that's how we serve. But we serve through not our own ego selves, but something larger that we allow to come through us. Yeah, exactly. Boy, and you can tell the difference between narcissism and ego self and uh, just sort of that more pure expression that's kind of the surrender state of, oh boy, I'm in, you know, you need arms and legs and lungs and fingertips and I'm in, you know, uh, let's go. And that energy is so different. Wow, you know, there's just a massive contrast. So you kind of know when you have one versus the other. And I know this is your thing. You're, you, um, it was, you started your career painting. So I want to go all the way back here as we start, because uh, what a story, you know. But you've been, uh, as I see it, you've kind of asked to be her expression and to talk about her in the world. So can you back us up and tell us a little bit about your personal story, if you would, Anna Dale? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, you're right. I, my first love was art. And I um, left, uh, I was studying psychology back east, and I left to come out to California and go to art school. And I was painting large public murals of landscapes and trompe l'oeil. And so to do research for that, I took more and more backpacking trips out to the wilderness, solo, solo backpacking trips. And in one of those, I discovered a plot of land on top of a mountain. And long story, I got to live there alone. And that was where it really came to me. Once I got away from the din of civilization, and I was solitary for two months there, just with my fire at night, and the fog, and the birds, and the ants, and you know all of that, I really had a kind of awakening about nature and the divine within nature. And uh, while I was up there, some hikers came up and found me at the top of the mountain. And I learned about a community that was just at the bottom of that mountain. And as I connected with them, uh, it was called the Church of All Worlds at the time. They were a neo-pagan organization that worshipped the goddess. And so I had a name for it and a whole framework. And to me, it was like coming home. It was like coming home to what made sense, what I had always been, what I had always known. And even back to, you know, like most people, I was raised in a Christian family and God was a he. And I said to mom, my mom, you know, mommy, why is God always referred to as a he? What does that mean for me? Oh, well, that refers to everybody, honey. Don't worry about it. And I just kind of accepted that that that's just the way it was and until I read Edith Hamilton's mythology in the ninth grade ancient history class. And it was a revelation that once upon a time, there were gods and goddesses. There was a multiplicity. And, you know, that was looked at with a kind of denigration, like, oh, we've grown out of that. <laughs> and yet we lost a lot of vital things in the process. So I began studying ancient history and even prehistory and finding out what was lost. And it's really half of the half of the Godhead, you know, half of the divine has been lost and buried and denigrated. And our world is out of balance and suffering because of it. Yes, yeah, so this is, um, and this goes to the heart of your work, you know, thank you for that personal story and then bringing it straight in where, as you've shared and what you write about and you teach and so on is, uh, boy, you know, when the goddess got uh, lost here uh, back in, uh, we're going to actually go to a video here that where you explain this well back in, you bring in the history of the, the Christian church and how goddess was washed out there. Uh, that we, you know, so much was lost, the divine feminine was lost, this whole sense of connection that is this oneness, this diversity and unity, this divinity. Uh, you're saying this was lost, it just, you know, it, it, it got washed out. Uh, so that, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Or actually, why don't we go, let's go to the uh, video clip, which you, uh, which is so, boy, uh, powerful, and then let's come back and talk about it. Here we go. Okay. As civilization advanced and humanity moved from its embeddedness in nature into the first farming villages and then later the city-states, many of the agricultural goddesses drifted into the past. Aging, as all living things do, even goddesses, 
turn the ancient agricultural mother goddesses into grandmothers, into wise old crones who lived on the edge between wild nature and civilization. The crone aspect of the goddess represents the dark part of the cycle, nighttime, winter, death, and the unknown. But she also represents the wisdom that comes from age and the transformative power of dissolution. But know that the crone's association with death speaks of a deeper cycle in nature that honors rest and stillness and emptiness and quiet, the fecundity of darkness and the possibility of rebirth. The crone part of the goddess story is a sad one, for it tells of the descent of the goddess, the loss of the goddess, brought about by the gradual takeover of patriarchal forces that systematically plowed the goddess into the underworld until her name was all but forgotten. Starting around 4000 BC, when the first nomadic herders began invading the peaceful farming villages of the steppes and extending through into the first centuries of Christendom, worship of the goddess was systematically suppressed and replaced with the ascendance of male gods. As the old order was undermined, things became unbalanced. We already saw in the myth of Demeter how much trouble that caused when the goddesses were replaced by male gods who were assuming their duties. As this transformation took place, the importance of nature took a back seat to the power of conquest and domination. Wars increased, elevating the status of men, and even the polytheistic pantheons of both gods and goddesses working in partnership eventually gave way to a single monotheistic masculine god. Not long after the Council of Nicaea proclaimed Christianity as the religion of the state for the ever-expanding Roman Empire, that was 325 AD, a few decades later, Emperor Theodosius ordered the systematic destruction of any remaining statues, temples, rites, literature, ordered it destroyed. And most of the fine art and literature of the goddess tradition was lost. The priestesses that served her were banished or killed, and even the uttering of her name could result in the punishment of death. And after that, if any remnant of the old religion remained, it was brutally exterminated during the Inquisition, where hundreds of thousands of women and some of the men that supported them were tortured or burned at the stake, and the goddess's name was stripped from the world. Oh boy, tough, but uh, true, huh, Anadea? So we're going to talk about that. That, I believe, is a clip from Mystical Journeys. So uh, Anadea has on Humanity Stream Plus on the platform, uh, creating on purpose this mystical journeys with these 10 other faculty, uh, architecture of the soul, and then the goddess. So there presently are 68 video trainings on Humanity Stream Plus. Those of you in the, uh, that are here in the green room, boy, be sure to use the search feature on Humanity Stream Plus. Go up and you just enter Anadea Judas name and you'll see all 68 programs will come up. Uh, and uh, as you can see, so just as we could see in this little video clip, boy, the way I, I, I was talking to you about this <laughs> when we chatted a little while back, the way you weave in history and culture and spirituality and modern day uh, worldview uh, and the unfolding of, uh, of the world that we're walking directly into, it's, it's a piece of art. Wow, you have a real gift. So. Um, do you want to, um, so I know, I know we watched a video clip that says a lot, and now I've shared more. Uh, what, what are you inspired to come in and share here now on this, Anadea? Well, even let's just put the video clip in a bit of context, because in that course, I talk about the goddesses, maiden, mother, crone, and queen. And really, we began with the mother. She was Mother Earth. You know, going back 30,000 years, as we dug into the earth, we found these figurines that it was a universal worship of a mother goddess 
who represented the life force in everything, that the divine was in the trees, the animals, the plants, in you, in me, and everything was interconnected, everything was one. And really, Gaia, now even from a scientific perspective, the Mother Earth, we understand that she self-regulates the oxygen in the atmosphere, the ocean salinity, the temperature somewhat, except we're messing with that, and um, that there was this intelligent, we're living on an intelligent being that is a unified uh, planetary creation, colossal entity of intelligence. And so we were connected with that. We weren't separate. But when the goddess, you know, matured into the crone or was, you know, the, the idea that she was an old hag, that was what patriarchy did to discount her and just, you know, push her into the outskirts. And that's as we moved away from nature, we became more concerned about the perils of human nature than the wonders of mother nature. And nature drifted into the background, and so did worship of the goddess, as I mentioned in the video. Um, but she represents, you know, the body and the material world. Now, the material world has been given a negative connotation. Oh, that's not spiritual. We have to go up and out. And that's more the masculine idea of spirituality. And yeah, the transcendent is great. I have nothing against that. I've been a meditator, you know, sitting still in the morning and, you know, going to my meditation for over 50 years. But there is something in the embodiment of our spirituality, in the celebration, in the joy, in the wonder, in the color, in the dance, in the music. And the goddess traditions were full of pageantry, full of the sacred, where everything was imbued as sacred. But when we went to this monotheistic God, we were separated from that. We went to church on Sunday, and the rest of the week was, you know, was not sacred. The everyday life was not sacred. Nature was not sacred. It was separate. And, you know, I know that you talk about this a lot, this paradigm of separation that we've been in, and overcoming that illusion to realize that everything is connected and part of one divine being that we are also divine. So it's essential to understand this was so lost that we didn't even know it was missing. And I didn't even know until I read, you know, Edith Hamilton's in ninth grade. And what we don't realize is what we lost in the process and how lost that is in the world today. So if you consider that, let's say the masculine is the right leg and the feminine is the left leg, you know, mythology and intuition and all of that is part of the left leg, science and rationality is part of the right leg. Humanity is trying to walk forward in time. And when we moved into the scientific era, humanity took a giant step forward to have science and to figure out, you know, that we had germs that were making us sick. We couldn't figure that out before and that we're in a universe it's expanding. Um, you know, that's important, but we're stuck. We can't take the next step without a left leg. You know, even democracy was created by our founding fathers. Democracy in Greece, where it was really born, included everyone, even slaves, but not women. And so we, we can't take the next step forward without the feminine. And it's not that the feminine alone is the answer. It's a partnership. But it's walking on our right and left legs both. Yeah, yeah, beautiful um, and so true. So true. Yeah, Lynn Twist uses a different metaphor to say the same thing. A bird that's just got one wing, so it's flying in circles. We don't have both wings flapping. And so true. And um, as you mentioned, and even the way we started out this program, what this brings us back into is uh, ultimate reality, actually, which is that this universal intelligence, consciousness, oneness, <laughs> this divinity of which we are all a part, uh, and then just being a living expression of that. And as uh, it, it, it almost feels like it's as simple as that, and not, not that that's simple, because we've got a journey here from, as you mentioned, a lot was washed out, a lot isn't understood. Um, this notion of goddess, my goodness, you know, uh, it's not like it's something that's talked about a lot. You, uh, you've really taken, you, you've really 
climbed the mountain with this one. And I, I love your personal story uh, that you shared. Do you want to bring that in of just what uh, the, the personal story around this? Well, you know, when I went and lived on top of the mountain, I discovered a community and um, that community and we were living off the grid. Mind you, this was before the advent of cell phones and personal computers. Um, you know, I would have to drive to town and pay a quarter at this place where I could take a shower. Uh, it was really quite and it was wonderful. I would not trade that period of my life for anything and at this point, I probably wouldn't do it again. <laughs> you know, I'm a little <laughs> old for that level of, of living. Um, but uh, it really showed me the goddess in all her glory and all her cycles and watching the moon rise and fall in a different place every night. And, you know, doing the seasonal celebrations with our community. And that was where I was ordained as a priestess in 1985. And in my ordination, I swore to serve her above and beyond all else. But the saying was something I took from the Ramayana. It says, when I do not know who I am, I serve you. When I do know who I am, I am you. And that is about the divine, whether it's masculine or feminine. It really, in that way, doesn't matter. But to me, it was serving the divine face of the feminine. So on those days when... I'm groggy and I don't know who I am or whatever. I know who I serve. I know what I serve. And on the better days, I know that I am that divine. And that's not an egotistical statement that, oh, I'm the divine and you're not. No way. It's that I recognize, I mean, it's the meaning of namaste. The divine lives yeah. within me and within all things. And I honor it from the divine in me to the divine in you. So it's a recognition that the divine is embodied in all things. That's what theism is. And it's interesting that the word atheist was first created in the Roman Empire for the early Christians because they denied that the divine was in everything and that there were many ways to express it. And so they were called atheists. They were against the divine. And it's interesting how that's gotten turned around, but they were wow. against the many expressions of the divine. Right. Yeah, I have not heard that story. So that's an interesting one. A theist. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Well, so take me through, if you would, Anadea. Um, you know, you, you, this has been your life journey. Here we are. We're, we're in early April 2024. So, and there's a lot going on, you know, as we know. Boy, there's a real spiritual awakening going on here. So... Where is the goddess in all of this? What, what ground, you know, have we now, uh, where, where, where we've made progress from, from what you described there in, you know, 325 AD? Uh, and, and what things are we focused on now? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the goddess was thoroughly plowed underground till we didn't even know she ever existed. And that's like living in a broken home with a single father who doesn't date, and you're never allowed to mention the mother until you didn't even know you ever had a mother. So humanity has been growing up in this broken home, but we don't even know it. Then around the 50s and 60s, and 60s mostly, even to the 70s, um, some archaeologists started discovering these goddess figures, and there was a resurgence. And that coincided with, you know, the era, era of women's liberation, where women were taking the curlers out of their hair and burning their bras and saying, let us into the workplace. We want to have the same rights as men. We want to we want to make our own living. And, you know, that happened. It still has a long way to go, but that happened. And the goddess resurgence started back then. And most of the early books were written by men. But then um, Merlin Stone and Eleanor Gaiden and various people were writing about the goddess. And, you know, the women were going, wow, we didn't know that about this. And it gave a whole meaning to women. I can regard myself as sacred. It's not other. Because when God is male, then the male is God. And that creates a diminishment of women. So that was one wave. And then women went into the workplace and they began to work and rise up the ranks and became CEOs and whatnot. But we realized we were becoming very masculine in doing that. We were entering into a male world defined by male values. Now, there's nothing wrong with those values. It's just that they're missing some other values. And so I think the next wave here 
of feminism, if you want to call it that, of, you know, the resurgence of the goddess, is the next wave is bringing the values of the feminine into the public conversation. It's not just about liberating women, that's part of it, but it's not liberating women to become like men. It's saying the values of love, of compassion, of connection, of diversity, immunity. You know, the goddess is so diverse. You look at a hillside of flowers and there's so many different kinds. She doesn't just make one. And she doesn't say, are you worthy to pick an apple off the tree? She just makes an abundance of apples. So um, diversity, compassion, connection, collaboration, these were the ways of the feminine. And as we are building our world and talking about how to do it, we need to have those values in the conversation or we can't take the next step forward. Yeah, no kidding. So um, we kind of went to sort of power over uh, and instead of this power in, and the power in is the divinity, is the sacred, is this, uh, is this beautiful merging that you've talked about here of male and divine feminine, isn't it? Um, the, the thing that uh, I go to on, uh, when we talk about things like this is it feels like, like in, in, uh, in school, we used to run in sixth grade, you'd run the 50 yard dash, you know, uh, and then, but there's the marathon. So it's almost like we're, we're living our lives as though there's just this one life. I'm, my, my body is who I am. And when my body goes, I go. And so I'm just going to run the 50 yard dash at just this body and what the body can sort of get out of the refrigerator, which is, even, <laughs> which is a real mess, isn't it? Oh, good goodness. So, but um, our, our near death experience friends, our medium friends, even we, because many of us have been trained now, you know, as we go into the non-physical realm, see our multi-dimensional selves and things, uh, see this whole revolving uh, door, which is life, which is everlasting. And when we go there, then we can run the marathon race where it's not here, what can I extract from the warehouse or refrigerator while I'm here, you know? No, <laughs> it goes into this whole beautiful tapestry of male and divine feminine where the whole point is the living expression of it with with all of what you know the real beauty and it's not power over at all it doesn't have that that feature actually does it no and you know you talk about the eternal and this brings me to one of the myths that i go into detail in the goddess book um which is the myth of demeter she's the goddess the agricultural goddess and um in that myth, and it's a long myth, I won't go into all of it, but at the end, what was created, she's, you know, when things were dying, when the patriarchy had taken over her role as agricultural goddess providing the food for the people, and the crops began to fail and the animals became sickly, you know, and people realized what they'd done to the goddess, she said, they said, what should we do? She said, build me a temple and reestablish my rights. And so they built a temple at Eleusis in Greece, about nine miles from Athens. There's a famous road paved from Athens to Eleusis. And they established the Eleusinian Mysteries, which were practiced for 2,000 years. And every citizen in the Greek culture went to that at least once in their life, whether they were slaves or merchants or kings or, you know, whatever. They all experienced the Eleusinian Mysteries. And what they came out seeing they said, I have seen the end of life and it's got a sent beginning. And I know now I am eternal. I will not fade away. And that was what they got out of the right of seeing. They went to the underworld where Persephone was abducted into the underworld and then she was reborn and they experienced that whole cycle and the mystery. And, um, you know, my Church of Our Worlds that I was a priestess of for so long, we reenacted the Eleusinian Mysteries for about 10 years in a cave at Pinnacles National Monument in California. And so we had pilgrims, you know, go down into the underworld, find Hades and Persephone, beg for her to return to the world of the living. And, you know, for each person, it was like, OK, you're going to go to the underworld. If you die, how are we going to remember you? And then when they got down there, their light was taken from them and it wasn't given back until they said, I have a reason to live. This is something I'm going to give back. And if Hades and Persephone decided that was a worthy cause, they would give them the candle to come back up to the world of the living. 
You know, the, your historical knowledge is astounding. I, I referred to that earlier when I said the way you weave in history and culture and uh, going way, way back, you know, to mystical times, uh, those early mystical stories, uh, and then into today's world. It's just, it's astounding. So, and let me shout out to you, you've got a book, The Goddess, which is, wow, I mean, what, a, what an incredible book. And, and many other books, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> The goddess. Down. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, powerful, powerful book. And in this uh, Mystical Journeys Masterclass that uh, we just, just brought out here just recently, about a month ago, uh, this is what Anadea brings in. So both, I want to shout out to the book, The Goddess, which is available in bookstores, and Mystical Journeys, where uh, Anadea brings in just this beautiful work and is doing live mentoring and all of that. Uh, just very, very powerful. So... Um, Anadea, what um, we, we were just saying, hey, I was asking the question and we said, uh, let's, let's talk about this on the air instead of before we come on the air. Uh, and it was this conversations with God. So uh, in, in this book, these series of books that talk about um, who, what, what life really is, what God really is, you know, who all is within the body of God, you know, these things. Um, what, did, does that do anything to, to revive the goddess, do you, do you think? Well, I think it does because I think Neil Donald Walsh had really a direct transmission that was outside of some of the uh, dogma of some of the patriarchal religions and, and asked people to really think for themselves. You know, no, God is not here to punish you. You know, God is not here to make sexuality a negative, sinful thing. It's, you know, I think his line was, you know, why would God give you toys if he didn't want you to play with them? <laughs> um, right. I, I remember that from one of the books. So yeah, that I was it. Right. He took it into a more direct transmission of the divine and took it out of that, you know, patriarchal overlay. But I'd right. love to do a companion volume, Conversations with Goddess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in another comparison, um, years ago, um, Deepak Chopra wrote How to Know God, which was a book that I read. Right. And it was all about transcendence and stillness and people that went into the cave and, you know, detached from society. But in the whole book, there were two words that I never saw. One was love and one was beauty. Yeah. And I think beauty is an essential aspect of the goddess. And I don't just mean one's physical beauty in the whole beauty industry, but, you know, everything in nature is beautiful. Everything. Even a burned out forest has its own strange beauty. And as we've built our world, we've forgotten beauty as a spiritual value. And, yeah. and love as a spiritual value. I mean, if we don't have that, it's not, it's not worth living. It's not worth creating a new world. Yeah, well, no kidding. So, and gosh, when I think of, you know, of course, Humanities Team, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. So this is, we have a North Star that's not top, <laughs> it's not money. You know, it's, it's yeah. a beautiful, it's a delicious way of living and where we, at the same time, create a sustainable, compassionate, and flourishing earth. Uh, so, but this personal awakening, which is, that's the basis, that's the whole lead in to conscious living. It starts with us personally. And of course, this whole, Spirituality is an inside out job. It starts with us and our own personal awakening where we open our eyes and go, oh my gosh, you know, I am seeing a different world. And you look at yourself, I am seeing a different self. And the earth, just you were bringing in the beauty of the earth. It's, you know, it's intelligent. It's got a soul. I mean, there's incredible wisdom, right? You, you, these are all things that, that, we, that, that are a part of the personal awakening, I think. Is that how you experienced it too? Because when you oh, were a young girl and went up in the hills, it sounds like that was kind of what was going on with you too. My awakening came in nature. It was very clear, you know, and I practiced yoga since 1975. I was initiated into TM and did meditation since 1972. So, I mean, I've, I've practiced the transcendent aspects and the imminent. And I think that's how we have to see the divine. It is both. Transcendent means... It's this greater thing out there, and imminent means it's the divine intelligence in here. And as we care for our body, as we care for our world, our home, our families, our garden, our, you know, our neighborhood, our, our cities, then we create a beautiful world that we are happy to live in. You know, another thing that was really denied from the goddess tradition is pleasure. 
and the role of pleasure in sacred sexuality. <clears throat> excuse me, sacred sexuality. And when that was made a sin and pleasure was, you know, denied, that made people very grumpy. <laughs> you know, we have the make love, not war, but uh, it's been proven that, you know, uh, many studies have shown in cultures that deny sexuality and the pleasure of that have more violence. And so yeah. when people are happier, they are nicer to each other. It's a really simple, simple premise, but we made that a sin. We made that something that we, you know, even to the point where, oh, I can't take a day off. I need to work because I'm only valuable if I'm working. And uh, I struggle with that one, you know, but, oh, no, there's something about kicking back and enjoying this beautiful world we've been given. You know, my view is that if I ask, what is humanity here to do at this time on the planet? And I think we're here to create heaven on earth, not to leave to go to heaven, but to bring heaven down. Um, my friend Neil Rogan said, we don't need to raise hell to change the world. We just need to lower heaven. And that's what I'm here to do, help create heaven on earth with beauty, with love, with connection, with celebration and joy and color and art and pageantry and bring that back again. Absolutely. Boy, you know, when I was sharing this whole revolving door that uh, indie ears and uh, mediums uh, bring in, you know, physical, non-physical life coming back to physical life where we say, I want to experience it, going back to the non-physical. This, this is the whole narrative there, isn't it? In that revolving door. The whole purpose uh, as it, and conversations with God shares this too. And of course, all of the mystical uh, and uh, uh, sacred text that is down through time it says the whole reason, actually, that we said I want to go into the into the physical was exact was to okay I want to create what's here in the non-physical, which is perfect love. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to I want to bring that into the physical realm. This is the narrative of the whole continuing life thing. That's the whole purpose. This heaven on on earth thing is I there's nothing but light here, you know, in the non-physical realm. Let me go down where there's where where there's an absence of light. I'll bring the light, you know. <laughs> And the simplicity of it, that's, that's kind of it, uh, which is exactly what you're saying you're called to. That's what we're, when we talk about making conscious living pervasive worldwide by 2040, this is it, you know, it's just where we're living in the fullness of it. We become, you know, the living God has a home, so to speak, or the living goddess has a home. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, very beautiful. And, and fortunately, I think we are actually uh, well on our way because... This conversation, uh, we were founded uh, 21 years ago, and I can tell you, boy, 21 years ago, we would have, this would not have uh, been in the same environment. We've come a, a good distance since 2003, and we certainly have a long way to go, but uh, we've come a good distance. Okay, let's go to another video clip we have here that's really very profound. Uh, in your introduction, I shared, you know, when we talk about uh, sacred chakra, sacred life, uh, that you have, you've made some great contributions. So. Let's go take a look at a video that, uh, where you explain this beautifully. So let's go to a definition of the chakras, something we can work with. I mean, we all know them as energy centers. That's kind of the common thing, but what's energy? What is the center? What do they do? So if we consider the architecture of the soul, then the, the body is your temple, and inside that temple, you can say you have seven major chambers in the temple. And each one is a center of organization for receiving energy, for assimilating that life force energy, for storing it, and for expressing it. So let me give you an example. In your house, you have a kitchen. That's where you bring in food. That's where you assimilate and cook the food, put things away in your cupboards. You might store something there. You have your staples that you store, and then you bring it all together to make dinner and you serve it. So we also take in breath. We assimilate that breath as the heart beats the oxygen into every cell of our body. You can hold your breath and you can store it. You can build up charge through doing pranayama and bandhas, and you also exhale 
and you express that. You're taking in information right now. You're assimilating it into your own language. You might be making notes in which you're storing it. And then when you become a teacher, you'll be sharing some of this information. So each of the chakras does these four functions. So receiving, assimilating, storing, and expressing. And they do them on different levels, on the level of earth energy. That would be your food that you eat, you assimilate. If you eat too much, you store it and you burn it up in activity. And it could be emotions. You feel emotions, you take them in. How do you assimilate your emotions? Maybe you store old emotions and you express them. And our action and our love, and we can apply this to each and every chakra. But those four functions need to have balance. If you receive more than you let go of, it's like taking more in-breath. After a while, you can't take any in. You're out of balance. You have to let it out. And if you're giving out more than you're taking in, it's like exhaling, ha, ha, ha. Then you get depleted. You have to stop and regenerate and take in. Or if you take in too much, then you store it too much. Or maybe you can't assimilate it, so you don't know how to store it. So all these functions need to be balanced in each of the chakras. I think that's so powerful. You know, of course, chakras, gosh, on uh, everybody here, we know a lot about chakras, but you bring new dimension to this where you break it down, you know, and uh, we can receive too much, we can share, we can uh, give too much. There's a balance here, you know, for each at each chakra level. Uh, really so beautifully explained. And as you mentioned, you're uh, in, in the introduction here where I was reading your biography, you do make a great contribution here, don't you, Anna Dale? Oh, I worked with the chakras all my life. I mean, that's my main you know, claim to fame in this lifetime and what I put most of my energy into. And it was interesting when I was asked to write the goddess book, I was like, is that kind of off brand for me? I mean, I've served the goddess all my life, but it's a different kind of thing. Um, and, you know, just the diminution that people look, oh, you're just writing a book about the goddess and get dismissed. But it's really the embodiment. And the chakras are a map for your personal journey and a map for the cultural journey of awakening as well. And if we take the values of the chakras in their simplest form and we say, we want these values embedded in a world we're creating, starting from the top, we have divine guidance. We are connected with something more intelligent and greater that comes through us and informs us. That's the seventh chakra. A vision of beauty, that we create a world that is beautiful, that is inspiring, that we live our life with a vision. Certainly you are a visionary, Steve, so you understand that. Truth is the value of the throat chakra of communication. You know, we have a problem with truth in this world. We have so much disinformation and deep fake videos and various things that we hardly know what the truth is. Just go outside. Just go outside in nature. You'll see the truth right there. But uh, founded on truth and harmony. Really, sound wants to be in harmony. Heart chakra, well, a civilization based on love. That's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but, you know, we, we want to bring it into the heart. We want to come from the heart. We want to have loving relationships and respect and compassion for other beings. We want, we come down to the third chakra, we want a civilization where individuals feel empowered. Right now in this power over paradigm that we're in, most people feel like, oh, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I want to do something, but I feel so disempowered. We want where people feel empowered to work together. I mentioned pleasure, that second chakra, where the emotions, the texture of experience are allowed and where people are enjoying themselves and, and having sacred pleasure. And then finally, health, coming down into the body, physical health, ecological health. And we need both in the physical world and to create you know, like I say, heaven on earth to bring all these principles down into the physical plane. Boy, that's beautiful. Thank you for uh, coming, you know, starting at the top, seventh chakra coming down. Uh, that's beautiful. And, uh, and also that's true. That's the manifestation and the, current. 
And I have a yeah. course on, on your on your stream of manifesting, which is starting in highest consciousness, creating a vision out of that, learning how to talk about that vision, finding the relationships you need to create it, making your to-do list and knowing how to do things and making it fun and bringing it down into manifestation. So there's a whole course on that creating on purpose that you have on yes. Humanity Stream. Yes, creating on purpose, right. So again, so when you go into Humanity Stream Plus, so there's the search feature. Boy, don't, make sure you use the search feature. We got a lot of people from Stream here. Also, we're out on social media channels. Uh, just go to humanitystream.net, humanitystream.net. And then you can see all of these over 175 master classes and transformational education programs. We were actually going through our inventory and we realized, oh my gosh, we are actually the largest global streaming platform today uh, for the um, uh, consciousness raising master classes and transformational education, which is real exciting. So, uh, and this here, Anna Deus makes a great contribution. Let me read again the names of her programs. There's 68 right now on the stream platform. So creating on purpose, which is the one we were just talking about uh, Mystical Journeys, which is the one she does with uh, 10 other faculty members that just came out, Architecture of the Soul, and then the Goddess uh, 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 Masterclass. So, um, and there are actually other programs on there as well. And as you can see here during this hour, uh, boy, Anadea has just got a wealth of wisdom. And more than that, you know, you're not just sort of a walking, talking library. You're, you know, this is your life. You are, you express it well. I mean, I feel this whole, you were saying on a bad day, I serve it. On a good day, I am it. Well, you know, I think you're mostly am it, you know, and, and I don't think I've seen you on the bad days. So, uh, and that's the whole, as, uh, that's really our theme here. As we keep coming back around to this, it is, it, that's, that's the whole invitation in life, right? Is to, is to be it, a living expression of it. You could call it a living expression of goddess, uh, you know, is, is, is the invitation here. And it's too bad. I grew up just like you did, Anna Dea. I grew up in the Catholic Church and uh, even was an altar boy and stuff. Uh, and we didn't have a Pope Francis back then. You know, he's, he's doing a pretty nice job of uh, cleaning house there. Uh, back in that day, boy, I got in a little trouble when I had a little too much water, not enough wine, you know, in that cup on a Sunday or something. Uh, but... Um, yeah, you know, and it's too bad, this whole discussion of sin. Um, my daughter went to an Easter Sunday uh, program uh, in New York City. Just, uh, of course, Easter was just this last weekend. And uh, she went with a friend and was real excited about it and all dressed up. And there was just a whole lot of discussion of sin throughout. And I, I said, oh, Sophie, I'm so sorry, you know. Uh, that's really not, that's not really what, you know, spirituality is about. Uh, and it's such a shame, you know, that we had to kind of descend down into that. Um, do we make mistakes in life? Sure we do. You know, at work, they call that an operating error. <laughs> you know, at work, of, oh, you know, we made a mistake. You know, good. What, we all make mistakes, right? We endeavor to clean them up. That's what maturity is. Of, well, I won't do that again. Uh, we don't have to go make some big deal out of it and, and, um, and then say, boy, you know, we've got to walk around with a, a big black thing on our head or something on our forehead, right? So, um, yeah, and anyway. the interesting thing yeah. about that sin is it creates a lot of shame and separation, but it doesn't address, you know, like if you harm someone, there needs to be a redress. You know, there yeah. needs to be, how can they make amends to you? Just going right. along in a mea culpa doesn't actually right the situation, it doesn't actually make amends. It just makes, you know, the person have more shame and, and more separation for themselves. Yeah, thank you for bringing that in because, right, and, and in the days and months, years ahead, uh, boy, you know, indigenous populations where we came over, you know, from the Columbus story, it's a different story than the story mm -hmm. we tell in history books now. So there are, uh, we do need to make amends. It's not like we just go on and don't address it. There's healing that's needed, which means honesty and, uh, and then uh, uh, real compassion and, and uh, loving embrace and all of these things. So exactly right. But we don't just walk around, you know, with a sort of a sword through us of, dang, you know, that thing was done and there's nothing that can be done about it. You know, it just, there isn't any good that comes out of that. It's caused a lot of suffering in our world. The idea of sin and, and shame has just, it, it's really undermines people's spiritual growth and it undermines their connection. 
and it it doesn't serve well. Yeah. So let me um, let me just do a shout out to people. We've got a lot of viewers here with us, and uh, you know, as we always share on these live programs, boy, this is. I mean, I'm having a delightful conversation. I'm so it's it's really fun to be here with Anna Dea. Uh, but what this is really about is, is you. We're actually with you. This is a conversation like in your living room, so to speak, where Anna Day and I are sitting on the couch and you're sitting on the couch with us. And uh, the invitation here is to live into the fullness, you know, this living goddess thing. Whoa, you know, living into the fullness of it. Uh, so where everybody's legs get strong and we realize, yes, this was the invitation in life. This is who I am, you know. Uh, you know, let's not make it a bad day where we serve it. Let's make it a good day where we are it, <laughs> right? Uh, because that's actually how this spreads. This is how it spreads, where people feel the vibration of it, the energy of it, uh, you know, that's, that's loving, that's healing, uh, et cetera. And uh, I think, Anadea, as we talk about sort of the weeks and months and years ahead, boy, my vision for this thing as it unfolds is, this is the thing that there's, there'll be where, you know, just like in the, uh, in the 1800s there at the time of the Civil War, where uh, there were years where it was okay to own a slave, right? And then immediately, mm -hmm. there were years immediately that followed where it was definitely not okay to, you know, to be owning a slave. So there was just, there was a tipping point thing that happened. And that the tipping point comes in here where enough of us are living on this whole conscious journey thing where you are at, where... You know, we're experiencing the deliciousness of it, I'll call it. You know, we could use a lot of different words. Uh, and where we're really coming into the fullness of why we were born here in the first place. And we realize just releasing these bonds of like having a job that really is not, that where our deeper values aren't there at all. You know, we, and it's just, it's, it's making us tired and run down, right? So, because we wouldn't do that when we're on this conscious journey we're we're gonna we're gonna be working in a place where our deeper values are are deeply felt, right? And there's a sense of contribution and there's a sense of loving expression and all of these things. And and that uh, that if we don't bring our values off, in, then we create something that's worthless. You know, values yeah. give something its worth, and we create a society that's worthless. So we have to bring our values in to <laughs> give it value. Absolutely. This is the goddess story. I know I'm going right into your goddess story here, are I not? I mean, that's what, that's why this is so important to you, is uh, these values that we're talking about and this whole unfolding that we're talking about. This is the goddess, isn't it, that we're talking about? It is. And, you know, I want to say something else, that the goddess does not, is not just about women. It's for men, too. You know, in my years in the pagan community that worshipped the goddess and gods, it was an equal number of men that participated. And they were happy men because they had women that were like goddesses and they were treated like a god. You know, who doesn't want that? And there was celebration and joy and equal participation and co-creation. So this is not just a women's thing. And I really want to say that. It's not, you know, uh, it, it's not... Um, it's not putting lipstick on Jehovah. <laughs> it is something for everyone. And the men oh can gosh. then yeah. reclaim some of the feminine in themselves that they've had to deny. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, so important. Wow. I mean, <laughs> I am like so a thousand percent with you on that. Uh, yes, because, yeah, this is not uh, 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 like we're calling women to something. You know, men, you guys can step out and, you know on the veranda from because <laughs> we're talking about the goddess. Oh my goodness, you know, the <laughs> conscious living is this whole, this beautiful intersection of the divine, you know, masculine and feminine. Uh, and it's just, it's just uh, bringing the goddess back because this, this, this is this whole, what uh, the body of work that you've brought forward is, it was really lost. And candidly, what was left here uh, that was the, 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 the masculine was not the divine masculine, you know. This power over that's not a, uh, you know, yeah. that that was that was a uh, a terrible mistake, uh, I think, that was made. Uh, this is not anything that's spiritual, or that has religious value, in my opinion. Um, it uh, well, think, you know brings in it brings yeah, in transactional. It's very paradigm served its purpose when humanity was younger. You know, in my book, uh, The Global Heart Awakens, I take humanity from its infancy to our current adolescence. And I look at the early childhood, which was 
the coming into the patriarchal, into the cities, what we call the beginning of civilization, where we were, you know, coordinating a diverse mass of people that had different worships and different languages and different customs. And it took a strong ruler to give commands and make all that work out because people didn't know how to get along. And that's similar to a young child, five, six, seven years old. The parents are still boss. You know, the parents tell you when you have to go to bed and they tell you, you know, make your meals for you and how you have to behave. That's appropriate for a young child. But as we go into adolescence, we're learning how to become adults. That model does not work anymore. It disempowers people. It doesn't harness the intelligence of humanity itself. And so we need a different operating principle. And this is where I say, the, the subtitle of that book was Humanity's Rite of Passage from the Love of Power to the Power of Love. And it's moving from third chakra to fourth chakra. And I think what we're going through on the planet right now is our collective initiation to the paradigm of the power of love from the love of power. And we're moving up in the chakras to the center one as an organizing principle, not just some sentimental feeling, but as an organizing principle for humanity, organized on egalitarian values, on cooperation, on collaboration around peace, around the things we know make it work. The world we know in our hearts is possible. Yeah, thank you for bringing in that historical context because that's true and that, that's why we're having this conversation today is we're at this big pivot right now, this, uh, this jump time where uh, it's, there's a whole new thing being born into the world because of our developmental state. Yeah, so, so uh, thank you for bringing that in. That's beautiful. So we only have a couple more minutes here and a day our hour has flown by and uh, I know you're so passionate about this uh, work of the goddess. Are there uh, calls to action, things you'd like to share here as we're coming on wrap up? Well, you know, there's a section in the book that is practices, and there's many different practices in there. But one that I put that I think you wouldn't find anywhere else is to do a ritual of apology to the goddess for all that was done to her, for all that's been done to the earth, for all that's been done to women. And I won't elaborate all the different laws and rules, and we know some of it's still around today, that the goddess has continued to provide, you know, we have spring anyway, you know, the cycle of the seasons continues. And though the earth is really assaulted right now, to just go outside, get down on the ground, put your face in the earth and say, I am so sorry for what has been done. And here's how I want to offer amends. And even if you yourself don't feel like you contributed to that, it doesn't matter. I can say I'm sorry to someone who lost a loved one. I didn't kill that person, but I can say I'm sorry for it. And that begins to restore a relationship and begins to acknowledge what was done and bring that trampling up from the ground and back into the culture again so we can dance with each other in balance. Oh, I love it. That's beautiful. So let's all that would just take a few minutes, right, to walk outside today uh, and to share this little prayer of uh, uh, apology, right, and of thanksgiving of, of what is coming, you know, as we're now getting our, our values and priorities back and uh, back right. So beautiful. Uh, Anna Dea, thank you so much for being with me here for the hour. Gosh, it has gone fast and uh, you're a, a wealth of wisdom and a wealth of passion. Uh, and uh, I so admire your uh, fortitude. Really, you know, from you mentioned in the 70s, you were teaching TM. Uh, boy, you know, we've been through a lot since the 70s and you <laughs> persevered. You know, you just have kept climbing that mountain uh, to uh, where today you've got all these books and classes and uh, programs and, and things. And uh, it's such a pleasure and privilege to be partnered with you, uh, Humanities Team and Humanities Stream Plus. So, um, woo, big, uh, big thank you. And looking forward to lots more collaboration here. Uh, as we come into the Global Oneness uh, Day uh, 2024 and beyond. So thank you. Um, I also want to thank my team here. We can back the camera up. You'll see Jim Gray is here in the studio. Uh, it's me on the couch. That's Jim over there. Jim, thank you. Another seamless day. We didn't uh, go down as we're live with Anadea and Marin. 
County there in the San Francisco Bay Area, me in Boulder, Colorado, bringing in these videos, and also uh, everybody that's here in the green room where we can see them on camera. Uh, thank you to you all uh, for being with us. Uh, just really lovely. Uh, and then Garth Catterall, Nanette Kennedy, Dee Meyer, Andy Gooski, Karen Watson, so many. I've got a lot of incredible partners and colleagues that make this program possible. Big shout out to all of you. Thank you. So viewers, um, so again, this whole uh, thing is just about our, our conscious journey. All of us are on this journey. That's why you're here watching. And uh, let's lean into it uh, with maybe a little more from today's program. We can go outside, um, as Anadea is suggesting, have a beautiful moment outdoors today. Uh, and uh, let's create this beautiful thing in our homes and the communities and out in the world and uh, ultimately a beautiful future that our kids will inherit, future generations will, will inherit here on the earth. So, uh, amen and amen, huh? <laughs> okay, love and peace and blessings, everybody. Thank you. We'll be back with you next week.